All right, why don't, why don't we begin again? Um, my name is Daryl Press. I teach at Dartmouth, and I work on US national security policy, nuclear weapons, changing balance of power, these sorts of topics. Um, I want to start the panel by thanking Kier Lieber and thanking Georgetown for hosting this terrific event. Though I have to say, um, when I saw the schedule, the first thing that crossed my mind is, Kier, really, a 3 o'clock panel start time. You know, 3 o'clock, you guys sitting out in the audience, you all. You're, well, that's what I was going to get to. You're a little bit tired, right? It's a beautiful spring day. Um, lunch has started to be digested, and you're kind of settling into your seat. And then I just heard John Mearsheimer speak, and I realized, actually, I had completely misdiagnosed the problem that this panel faces. It's not that you're all asleep. The problem is, how are we going to be more provocative, more controversial, more entertaining than John Mearsheimer? So that's the challenge that Kier put before us, and that's the challenge that we have with you. But the good news is I think we can do it, that we have a terrific panel, we have a terrific topic. The topic is about the future of arms control. We have a ter terrific panel, which I'll introduce in a second. Um, originally, Jan Nolan was gonna be on our panel. Jan's not feeling well, unfortunately, so she regrettably had to pull out at the very last minute. But we still have John Maurer to my immediately, immediate left. John Maurer is a Kissinger Fellow at Yale, and he just finished a dissertation on arms control in the 1970s and 80s and um, is most of the way to finishing a terrific, terrific book, which, um, which we uh, mentioned in the last panel. Um, to John's left is Frank Rose, who's a senior fellow at Brookings. And Frank has had a many decades long career working largely within the US government, both in the Defense Department and the State Department, on topics that are directly related to this panel about, about arms control and strategic competition and these sorts of things. So it's, it's a great, great panel. Um, Kier asked me to not merely chair the panel, but also be a panelist. And so it does create a conflict of interest, which is, he said, to hold people to 15 minutes and also be a panelist. And so in the way I guess Jan wrote, what was Jan's book, Guarding the Guardians? Guardians of the Arsenals. Yeah. What was this? Guardians of the Arsenals. Uh, well, somebody else who wrote Guardian, Guarding the Guardian. But regardless, the question is, who's going to keep me on schedule? That will be the, the, the problem. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off our conversation about the future of arms control. And I'm going to give what I, what I realized as I was looking over my notes is a rather gloomy talk about the prospects for arms control. But what I want to emphasize is the real takeaway from the talk is not that arms control is unlikely going forward. The real takeaway is actually worse than that, which is that arms control in the context that we're facing, which I'll describe in the, the course of my talk, Arms control in this context is not merely unlikely, it's actually dangerous. That there are very, very serious landmines we have to avoid as we push forward new ideas for arms control, and I'll describe those. Why is this in a nutshell? In a nutshell, the problem is there are growing fissures between the typical arms control toolkit, the toolkit which arms control advocates have been, have been using tremendously successfully for the past 25 years. There are increasing fissures between the arms control toolkit on one hand and the realities of the 21st century on the other hand. And so that doesn't mean we abandon arms control and we decide we're better off having an uncoordinated, no holds barred competition with our strategic adversaries. No, it just means that the minefields to avoid are more serious than I think the arms control community has recognized and more serious than might meet the eye at first glance. And so that's what I'll talk about. So there are three things I'd like to talk about. Number one, a brief, discussion of the underlying logic of arms control. How is arms control supposed to work? What's it supposed to achieve? Number one. Number two, the three challenges to arms control in the 21st century. I think the list is actually longer than three, but I'm going to focus on challenges stemming from changes in technology, changes in geopolitics, and the continuity in US foreign policy. And those three things together create big problems for arms control. And then number three on my list, I have a note um, stemming from um, direction from Kier that said, try to find a way to end on a less gloomy note. <laughs> I will. I haven't written that part of my talk yet because I was kind of stumped, but I think I'll come around to something at the end. So that's my task. So OK. So starting with the underlying logic of arms control. Let me point out to begin that modern arms control theory, modern arms control, con uh, arms control conceptions are not based on some naive utopian concept of international politics. They're simply not. There are some folks out there who basically believe if we can convince people to disarm, then we'll have peace. But that's not really the mainstream argument that's driving serious arms controllers. 
Arms control theory, arms control practice, frankly, is a pretty hard-nosed business. It's driven by the assumption that countries pursue their own national interest, that countries are, in fact, deeply concerned about their security, and in many cases, the security of their allies, and that countries are logically rather distrustful of each other, and especially of former adversaries. But nevertheless, the argument is, is that cooperation is possible, that it's possible in certain circumstances to devise agreements in which you, in a bilateral or multilateral context, agree to reduce the numbers of weapons or ban certain classes of weapons or create various types of inspection regimes, and that the net consequence is to make both participants or all participants in these arms control agreements more secure. Not because, again, of some naive conception of fewer weapons means fewer bad thoughts or anything like that, but because through careful arms control agreements, you can agree to eliminate classes of weapons and types of postures which themselves are threatening. Weapons that are vulnerable to attack and therefore which create incentives to preemption, incentives to shoot first. And not only can you reduce the incentives for preemption or incentives to shoot first, you can probably save money in the, in, you know, through, through the arms reductions. And I think the overall idea of arms control is not simply to leave the two sides at a stage where they hate and distrust each other but are confident that a first strike is not coming. The overall hope is through repeated rounds of this, you can build up a set of guarded trust where you come to the, 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 the viewpoint that an adversary who is really hoping for aggression at you probably wouldn't go down this path of arms control. And so through careful graduated steps, you can move to a more cooperative relationship, fewer, fewer incentives for, for strikes, and, and save money in the process. And I think, frankly, it's true that there are circumstances in which that's a real possibility. And I think, frankly, the end of the Cold War, and in fact, the late 1980s, saw a circumstance where we in the Soviet Union, the United States and the Soviet Union, were able to follow those paths in ways that were fruitful for both of them. All right. So what are the challenges? What are the problems with arms control today? And again, I think there's several, but I'm going to focus on three. The first one is stemming from changes, changes in technology. The changes I'm going to talk about all have a common source. The common source is the computer revolution. And the argument is changes stemming from the computer revolution have led to a, a cascading set of technologies which have the result of making all nuclear arsenals more vulnerable to preemption and destruction than they were in the past, and particularly small nuclear arsenals vulnerable to destruction. What are the technological changes I'm talking about? It's things like the accuracy revolution, which we've seen happen in front of us in the last four or five of America's wars, where you see small conventional weapons flying through windows, driving down the streets of Baghdad, you know, essentially. So it was the accuracy revolution. During the Cold War, even the end of the Cold War, hardened targets, things like missile silos, were actually very difficult to destroy, even with extremely high yield nuclear weapons. That was then. Today, for any country with modern ballistic missiles, destroying hardened targets is relatively straightforward. So the accuracy revolution is a game changer. Number two, the revolution in sensing. It's happened down five or six different dimensions simultaneously. We could talk about them in Q&A. But the short version is this. During the Cold War, it was extremely difficult to find, let alone track, mobile and moving targets. Think submarines or mobile missile launchers. Today, it remains difficult, but the balance between those who are hiding versus those who are seeking has shifted dramatically. The job for the hiders is getting a lot harder. The job for the seekers is getting somewhat easier. Specifically, if it's your job to hide a large metal cylinder under the water, your job in 2019 is a lot harder than it was in 1950 or maybe even in 1970. If your job is to hide a mobile missile launcher in the hills of North Korea or in the hills of China, your job's a lot harder today than it was 20 years ago. So number one, there's a revolution in accuracy. Number two, there's an ongoing revolution in sensing. 
Uh, three, four, five, and six, I'll just list them off. Um, in great um, innovations in autonomous systems, which have a whole variety of implications. Innovations in artificial intelligence, which is hugely useful for categorizing or doing a first cut of categorizing targets when you have streams and streams of data coming from these sensor systems. You have huge improvements in communication reliability and bandwidth, which shrinks the time from sensor to shooter. You have big increases in data processing. When you put the whole thing together, what's the upshot? The upshot is that during the Cold War, you could engineer a situation in which substantially smaller arsenals on both sides left both sides very, very secure. Because you couldn't find the remaining nuclear weapons the other side had, and even if you could find them, you weren't gonna be able to destroy them with high enough probability. That was then. Today, it's increasingly becoming true that small arsenals equal vulnerable arsenals. That's a slight exaggeration, but it's a slight exaggeration. And that's the direction we're going. Small arsenals equal vulnerable arsenals. I'll say um, quickly that the greatest achievement of modern arms control was the achievement that they, that they accomplished in the, in the wake of the Cold War. Whenever you throw up your hands and you think arms reductions are impossible, ponder this. At the end of the Cold War, each side had approximately 10,000 deployed strategic nuclear weapon systems. Today, that number is about 1,200 each between the United States and Russia, which means we had an 88% reduction on each side in deployed strategic weapon systems. Phenomenal success. What I'm telling you is we may have gone too far. We may come to regret that. The Russians, I think, already are, and we may suffer from their regret. Let me emphasize one other aspect of this. I'm gonna to have to give some short shrift to the other two points, but it's important, which is when we talk about the accuracy revolution, people's eyes sometimes glaze because they think, well, nobody's gonna use nuclear weapons to attack hardened targets. There's a different implication of the accuracy revolution that people often skate over, and it's this. During the Cold War, when there were big limits to accuracy, more or less the only weapon systems that threatened nuclear weapons were nuclear weapons. That has changed. Increasingly, the biggest threat to nuclear weapon systems are conventional weapons. That change in and of itself completely upends the logic of arms control, or at least the logic of arms cuts. Wrap your head around this. Back in the Cold War, if you negotiated a substantial arms reduction treaty with the, with the Soviet Union, if it was verifiable, when you reduced your arsenal, you made yourself more vulnerable to a disarming attack because there were fewer targets in your country that would have to be destroyed. However, the bilateral cuts meant you were also reducing the number of weapons in the adversary's country that could destroy those targets. But the accuracy revolution has made conventional weapons lethal killers of nuclear systems. And as a result, the whole notion of small arsenals being secure is deeply problematic because arms deals reduce the number of targets that must be destroyed, but they don't constrain the weapon systems, the conventional weapon systems that can do the destroying. The bottom line from all of this is honestly, we could have serious good debates about the merits of living in a nuclear world where some types of destructive human behavior has been prevented by deterrence versus living in a world of abolition, if we could get rid of nuclear weapons. There are good arguments on both sides, but I would argue the one world that is clearly the worst of both of those is the world of small, vulnerable arsenals. And that's the direction that technology is pushing us, and we need to beware. The other two arguments, which I'll make in much more brief, brief way, is about geopolitics and US foreign policy. The geopolitical point has been um, alluded to in several other talks, so let me just make it quickly, which is a lot of our thinking and our practices and our agreements in arms control are predicated in a, in a, in a bipolar world. It's, that's the world in which we got used to these arms control deals. And the problem is bilateral arms control agreements in a world in which China is a major player in international politics and poses real national security threats to the United States is truly nonsensical. It's truly nonsensical. Um, let me kind of say it this way, is, is I can imagine two different approaches to arms control in this multipolar world. One of them is through numerical reductions. So the United States and Russia could decide, let's have bilateral, once relations improve, let's have bilateral numerical arms reductions down toward the level that China currently 
currently fields. And once we get to China's levels, then we can bring all three countries into multilateral agreements. I think that's what China would suggest. The problem with this is exactly what I just described in the first you know, five minutes ago, which is arms control agreements predicated in substantial cuts to forces might very well lead us all to a world that we regret, where there's multilateral vulnerability. The alternative is an arms control arrangement that's not founded on numerical cuts, but rather limits on types of capabilities. That's also increasingly problematic in a multilateral context, simply because the geopolitical and geographic context in Europe and Asia are so different from each other. The military capabilities and weaknesses that the United States and Russia and China all field are so very difficult, different from each other that it's very difficult to figure out what sort of capabilities all three of those countries would like to constrain. I'll tell you right now, the United States would sign up for I think almost any arms control deal out there that would strengthen the prohibitions against inhibition or, or interference with space-based sensors. Everything that interferes with space-based sensors or threatens constellations of satellites we think is terrible and escalatory. China would never agree about that. Why? Because they face US conventional military dominance, which is largely knitted together by America's dominance in space. China would love arms control deals that basically said, let's agree that we won't have, let's say, we won't ever fight wars that involve conventional attacks on each other's homelands. Everything has to be offshore, whatever. We would never agree about this, because how in the world are we supposed to project military power to defend our allies in East Asia if China has a sanctuary in its homeland from which it can coordinate attacks against our airfields and our ships, et cetera? The problem in three different domains with three different adversaries of finding qualitative limitations, it's not impossible, but it's gonna be an order of magnitude more difficult than the problems we faced in the Cold War. All right, last point is alluded to in the second one, which is just the challenges of US foreign policy. Um, I, let me just say it very simply, is, is the United States has allies all around the world. The United States has, has decided has a, a global foreign policy knitted together with alliances um, in, in basically every part of the world. Many of these allies face um, conventional threats. Some of them face nuclear threats. And what this means is in the 21st century, partly because of the technological changes I described, a world in which the United States is gonna retain the ability to project military power conventional military power to uphold our NATO commitments to Baltic states or to uphold our commitments to, let's say, South Korea or Japan in the face of either Russia's or China's anti-access capabilities, that's a world in which the United States is going to have to have rather fearsome conventional capabilities to disrupt command and control and, and ISR and the adversary. So if you heard my talk on the beginning of this talk where I was talking about the problems, the threats that conventional forces pose to nuclear weapons, and you said, well, let's just get rid of these pesky things like precise conventional strike. The problem is you can't get rid of those things if you want the United States to be able to defend Japan or Taiwan or the Baltic states. You're gonna need precision conventional strike in order to get into the envelope of other people's anti-access capabilities. All right, conclusion. There are three things I think I principally want you to take from the talk. Number one, Arms control as an endeavor, we still need arms control. The alternative, it just says, let's have non-coordinated, non-thoughtful, you know, uh, no holds barred competition to get, it just doesn't make sense. That also does not fit the strategic reality of the world that we face right now. But what I would say is arms control advocates should not aim at force reductions. If your goal, I think arms control advocates have lost the distinction between means and ends. You adopt certain policies as a means to achieve certain ends. If your end is reducing the probability of war and also reducing the intensity of war should it occur, frankly, trying to get further reductions in nuclear arms among the most powerful countries in the world I think is counterproductive. I think the United States could still have a secure second strike with a, a much smaller arsenal simply because of the, 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 the quality of our submarine force. But Russia would not, and China would not. And wishing that might, might lead us to a situation that we regret. We regret. So it's not only don't hope for, don't propose future arms cuts, number one. Number two, I think the most fundamental problem I want you to take that I've described is this intersection between technology and foreign policy. I think that's the nub of the problem, fundamentally, which is American strategy is based on power projection. That's our foreign policy strategy. It's based on the ability to project power. And frankly, 
That requires having conventional capabilities in regions where there are strong, technically sophisticated countries who have a strong, strong interest in preventing the United States from operating. And principally, they're looking for ways to threaten US and allied airfields, US and allied ships, US and allied ports, these sorts of targets. Given that context, finding ways to reduce the threat that we pose to others while still being able to maintain our alliance commitments might be a problem, a Gordian knot that is, that is nearly impossible to solve. But if you ever look at these, at these kind of forced decisions and you're like, why don't we just opt to be less threatening? The answer is it's inconsistent with our foreign policy. All right, the good news. What is the good news? I think that there's good news in the sense that there is tremendous, there is tremendous opportunity for new research. Um, the, the cornerstone of the good news, uh, I, so I say this in a, in a kind of a wry way, but I actually, I actually mean it. From about 1965 to 1990, there wasn't that much that was interesting to study and investigate with respect to nuclear weapons. All that you needed to know, let's say 1970, as a civilian analyst, as a civilian thinker, as a master student going working for government, all you need to know about nuclear weapons and deterrence, we could have fit on an eight and a half by 11 car, um, sheet of paper. Nuclear weapons are immensely destructive, a no-holds-barred war between the United States and Soviet Union would almost certainly lead to the destruction of both countries. Let's try to avoid it. And I think that you could get away with only knowing that. The, the landscape for nuclear deterrence and, and the prospects for arms control are vastly more complicated now, as you're seeing rapid shifts in the global balance of power, big questions, not just raised by the current administration, but also raised by these changes in the balance of power of the nature of the US commitment to its allies and the capability and the will for the United States to actually act upon these commitments. And you're also seeing brand new questions arising from the changes in technology. So from the standpoint of, of the world, these are difficult times, but frankly, they're always difficult times. From the standpoint of people who might be going into a career studying national security policy or scholars trying to understand these, the landscape is wide open because the questions are really, really interesting and they haven't been answered yet. So there's the good news that I have. And with that, let me turn it over to John Maurer. Thank you very much, Daryl, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Kier, uh, for convening the conference and thanks to Jordan for organizing this event. Um, I've been asked to speak to you today about the history of arms control. And I'm, since this is a nuclear weapons themed conference, I'm going to focus my remarks on the history of American arms control policy in the Cold War, the nuclear arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union. So I wanna begin by telling you what I think in a very simplified way is the usual story of arms control in the Cold War. So once upon a time, the United States and the Soviet Union waged a very dangerous nuclear arms race with each other to try to gain some form of nuclear advantage, the one over the other. And they did that for about 20 years, and by the mid-1960s, the leaders of both superpowers recognized that the arms race was futile, that there was really no advantage to be gained in further nuclear competition. And instead of continuing the arms race, they decided to come together in an arms control negotiation to end that arms race. By cooperating through arms control, the superpowers were able to stabilize the arms race, improve their relations with each other, and at the end of the day, actually help end the Cold War itself. So this, I think, again, in a very simplified form, is our sort of normal historical understanding of the broad arc of arms control in the Cold War. That story of arms control is a myth. It's a very good myth. Like all good myths, it contains a number of important kernels of truth in it. But in general, and I hope as you've been hearing today, um, nuclear competition continued throughout the entirety of the Cold War. The fundamental principle of most of our understanding of Cold War arms control, that there came a moment where the United States and the Soviet Union said to each other, let's not compete anymore in the nuclear realm, never happened at least on the American side, and we have good reason to believe on the Soviet side as well, nuclear competition continued to the end of the Cold War, which leaves us with a really interesting historical question about arms control in the Cold War, which is why then were there arms control negotiations, if not to cooperate in ending the arms race, 
What was the purpose of arms control? Well, fortunately, at least on the American side, we have an increasing ability to actually study that question today because it's been 40, 50 years since the beginning of these negotiations in the late 60s, early 70s. And we have a huge body of declassified material that we can now exploit to try to answer that very question. What was going on inside the American government? What was the purpose of these arms control negotiations that pick up with the SALT talks in the late 1960s and early 1970s? And the answer that is emerging from these documents as we dig into them is that arms control was not a solution to nuclear competition. It was not meant to be a solution to nuclear competition. Arms control was a part of nuclear competition. Arms control was a tool on the part of the United States government to wage a continued nuclear competition with the Soviets. And the United States used arms control to pursue a competitive nuclear strategy in a number of ways. I'm going to focus on three of them today. First, the United States government used arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union to dictate the pace of competition. By engaging in arms control negotiations, the United States could choose when competition occurred, or at least shape when competition occurred, in ways that allowed the United States to avoid competition in periods of weakness. The key example of this is the 1972 ABM Treaty, the subject of my upcoming book. The United States, through the mechanism of the ABM Treaty, was able to slow strategic competition in the early 1970s during and immediately following the Vietnam War, providing the United States with an opportunity to recover its power and then recontinue competition at a later date. Under the ABM Treaty, the superpowers agreed not to deploy ballistic missile defenses for the indefinite future, but each retained the ability to continue testing, both in the lab and agreed upon testing facilities and maturing ballistic missile defense technology. The United States exploited that capability to the full under the ABM Treaty, staving off a Soviet ABM deployment in the early 1970s while maturing the technology that would ultimately lead to our ballistic missile defense programs today. In that way, the United States used the ABM Treaty to dictate the pace of competition with the Soviet Union. Second, the United States used arms control negotiations to shift the domain in which competition with the Soviet Union took place. The United States was able to determine where competition occurred in ways that promoted American strategic advantages. The key example of this is the 1987 INF Treaty, much in the news recently. Um, the United States, through the INF Treaty, was able to ban competition with the Soviets in land-based intermediate range missiles, but allowed both the United States and the Soviet Union to continue deploying intermediate range missiles of increasing destructive power and accuracy at sea and in the air as air launched cruise missiles. It's not a coincidence from the American strategic perspective that the Soviet Union was considered to be a vast continental land power and that the bases of American power, as Darrell was just telling us, in terms of power projection capability are primarily naval and aerial. In this way, the INF Treaty shaped competition and pushed nuclear competition out to sea into a domain where the United States perceived it enjoyed significant advantages. Third and finally, the United States used arms control negotiations to shift the arms race from a competition for the number of weapons to a competition of the quality of weapons. John Mearsheimer alluded to this in his talk. Shifting competition from numerical competition to qualitative competition supported the United States offset strategy in the second half of the Cold War, a strategy where the United States tried to exploit its major advantages in high technology. The Soviet Union's command economy at the time was perceived to have a major advantage in deploying large numbers of relatively simple weapons, whereas the United States high-tech economy had an advantage in deploying relatively small numbers of exquisite, highly advanced weapons. The key arms control agreement in this regard is the 1991 START-1 Treaty. START-1 limits and indeed reduces the number of missiles, strategic missiles, in the United States and at the time the Soviet nuclear arsenal but allows for continued improvements in warhead accuracy, reliability, fractionalization, sensor improvement, all of the technologies that Daryl just described as driving this process of American um, strategic nuclear hegemony. In that regard, I think it's important to recognize that the process that Daryl was describing, the process whereby arms reduction and increases in weapons accuracy are creating 
possible nuclear vulnerabilities that a technologically advanced great power could exploit, that combination is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's actually something that was designed by American policymakers in the second half of the Cold War to promote a process that they perceived at least would promote American advantages in high-tech weapons. All right. So these are three ways that the United States sought to use arms control to promote its competitive strategy. I want to talk very briefly, how do we know that this was the United States' intention? There's actually, the United States government spent a great deal of time in the second half of the Cold War to the present day emphasizing in its public statements that arms control was a cooperative exercise, that it was about promoting the mutual benefit of the United States, the Soviet Union, today the United States and Russia. So how would we know that these were actually part of the American intention in the arms control negotiation? Well, I alluded to previously, we have a huge body of newly declassified sources, and they provide us with information in several different ways. The first is that sometimes American leaders were actually very explicit behind closed doors about their competitive motives when it came to arms control. There's a variety of sources that we're still attempting to dig into and exploit in this regard, but one of the most useful in my current work has been the Nixon tapes. There's a huge body of recorded conversations that took place in various executive offices during the Nixon administration, very famously uh, involved in the Watergate scandal. But for us today, very useful in trying to piece together what the motives of American policymakers were. There are a number of conversations on the Nixon tapes, very, what seem to be very candid conversations about deploying arms control to promote American nuclear advantage. Uh, conversations that I have not seen reflected yet in any written uh, memorandum of conversation. So the ability to access this sort of high quality declassified material, we sometimes find that American leaders were explicit about this. But secondly, the larger documentary basis also allows us to examine in greater detail the arms control process within the US government. We can actually compare, at a fairly detailed level, the various arms control proposals that were considered by American presidential administrations behind closed doors, the rationales that were advanced for those proposals, and then try to map out which proposals did the United States reject and which did it accept in terms of its arms control policy. For example, in the Nixon administration, there was a major debate about whether the 1972 ABM treaty should ban not just the deployment of missile defenses, but also all testing of missile defense technology. And it was argued by a number of people at the time that banning testing would actually make the agreement more secure and easier to verify, because you wouldn't have to get into the weeds of, oh, but does this test actually meet the qualifications that were spelled out in the treaty? And hawks within the Nixon administration in internal deliberations actually accepted that banning testing would make the treaty more easily verifiable, but also argued that it was key to American security that the United States continue to test. And as a result, the Nixon administration rejected that version of the ABM treaty in favor of one that allowed the United States to promote its advantages. We see similar discussions in later arms control agreements. For example, in the INF Treaty, there was a major debate about whether the INF Treaty should include not just land-based missiles, but also sea-based missiles, the British and French nuclear forces, American tactical aircraft in Europe, all of which the US government consistently rejected in favor of an agreement that would allow the United States to push strategic competition out to sea. So what does this historical analysis mean for today? Well, I think it's very important that we be able to get into the weeds of what was going on in the Cold War because the, the myth of Cold War arms control is alive and well today. It permeates a great deal of our commentary on nuclear strategy and arms control. And I think that being able to recognize that during the Cold War there was an important competitive dimension to American arms control policy is important to us today for a number of reasons. I'd like to outline three in conclusion. The first is that I think it's very important that we not ascribe cooperative motives to any actor on the basis of its willingness to participate in an arms control negotiation. That goes for American interlocutors like Iran or North Korea, but it actually goes for the US government itself. We also shouldn't assume that because the United States is willing to engage in arms control dialogue, it's somehow seeking improved relations with other countries. It may be, but we have no reason a priori to assume that that's the case. Second, I think that it's very important that we take criticism of American arms control policy from other countries perhaps more seriously than we have in the past. For example, when Russian commentators criticize the INF Treaty as being an unfair and prejudicial arms control agreement, one that places undue burden on Russia specifically, they may not be incorrect. 
they may not be gaslighting the United States. They may actually believe and have some good reason to believe that the INF Treaty was in some ways prejudicial, that it was designed to promote American advantages. Now that's not to say that we need to adopt the, adopt the Russian commentary policy as our own policy on the INF Treaty, but I think in understanding our interlocutors, in understanding the way that arms control is perceived around the world, it's important to recognize the ways that the United States has used arms control to manipulate and in some cases harm other countries. The third and final point is that as we think about the future of arms control, I would echo Daryl in saying that we need to think long and hard about where arms control fits in our own strategy. The legacy arms control agreements that we have today are a product of a very specific strategic circumstance in the second half of the Cold War. They may have made sense then. Certainly there was a fairly coherent strategic logic that was laid out for those agreements. But we need to understand that those agreements were not intended by many of their originators as timeless Per, you know, uh, timeless agreements of human progress towards some improved nuclear-free or nuclear-stable future. They were designed to advance very specific American strategies in very specific circumstances. And I think that if we want to be successful with arms control today, we really need to ask ourselves, what is the American strategy today? Be it competitive or cooperative or whatever we decide. And how can we build arms control that will support that strategy? Thank you all very much. Thank you, John, that was terrific. Let me just say very quickly for the students, I know there are a lot of students out there, is, is oftentimes if, if you're a student, you're new to these, these topics, it's not always entirely clear when you're being, having something explained to you which was already known by the field and you're having an expert explain to you and, and when something is, is truly new. John's presentation there is, is deeply, deeply unconventional and insightful and a very, very fresh interpretation of arms control as well as, in my mind, convincing. So that's really terrific. The challenge he just posed, by the way, for Frank, who Frank worked tirelessly for the past 30 years promoting arms control, <laughs> is what John just said, that, that Frank is a, is a disciple of counterforce every much as the people who designed the Trident to so with that, um, Frank Rose, the floor well, is yours. Well, it is just a pleasure to be here today. Care, thanks very much for having me. And I just want to say what excellent presentations Daryl and John gave. And actually, you'll find a lot of what I say is very consistent with uh, what you have said. Indeed, John Mearsheimer talked about John's book. I strongly recommend John's article in War on the Rocks, which is a nice summary of how we have used, um, I would say, arms control to advance US competitive advantage. So what I want to try to do today is answer two fundamental questions. The first one is, what has gone wrong with the current US-Russia strategic arms control framework and second, how might we get the strategic arms control process back on track? Uh, and I come to this not as an academic, but someone who has really been in the mix within the government at State Department, on Capitol Hill, in the Defense Department for over 20 years. So to a certain extent, it's a bit of a cynical view and a political view, but I think an important perspective to provide you. Um, first, I think we need to recognize that we are in a fundamentally different security environment than we were in the 1990s. I've increasingly come to the view that the progress that was made on arms control in arms reductions during the 1990s was a result of the unique political circumstances of the time, primarily the collapse of the Soviet Union and Russia's subsequent financial difficulties. However, I think many in the United States believe that Russia shared the American view that cooperatively reducing our nuclear arsenals on the long road to zero was also the Russian view. I don't believe that is the case. Uh, for example, I like to say Russia did not sign the New START Treaty in 2010 
because they believe in a world free of nuclear weapons. I assure you, they don't. Uh, I remember being at the 2015 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference, and I was talking to one of my Russian colleagues, and he looked at me with a straight face, and he said, I fear a world without nuclear weapons. I think he was only being half facetious, because as John Maurer and John Mearshower talked about in their respective talks, Russia views nuclear weapons, given its security uh, situation, as central to its, uh, its security strategy. Uh, in my view, you know, what was New START about? I think for the Russians, it was about maintaining strategic parity with the United States. Remember, for the Russians, strategic nuclear weapons, besides the uh, UN Security Council, is one of the few places where they sit as equals with the United States. It was about capping the size of the US nuclear arsenal. And thirdly, it was about providing Russia insights into the US nuclear arsenal that it wouldn't necessarily get without the treaty. Uh, so there are real reasons. I, I always like to say the Russians have an unsentimental view towards nuclear arms control. It's not about grand visions. It's about managing their weakness. Um, and I'd also add that the geopolitical situation has shifted fundamentally since the early 1990s. Um, in the early 1990s, US foreign policy was fundamentally focused on integrating Russia and China into the US-led international order. That is no longer the case. Now the relationship is primarily about how do we effectively manage competition in a way that reduces areas of potential conflict. So we're in a fundamentally different geopolitical situation than we were in the 1990s. And I think that is key to understanding kind of the nuclear strategy and the arms control uh, dynamics. Now second, and, and this is really related to what John talked about in his presentation, I think since the end of the Cold War, we've seen a gradual decoupling of defense strategy and arms control. For example, as John talked in, uh, discussed in his presentation, if you look at all the major arms control agreements of the Cold War era, era the INF Treaty, the START I Treaty, the START II Treaty, each of those treaties had a specific defense strategy or stability goal. Uh, for example, the INF Treaty was fundamentally about eliminating Soviet medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. The START I Treaty, it, yes, it reduced numbers, but fundamentally, it was focused on reducing the number of heavy Soviet MIRVED ICBMs. It cut the number in half and prevented the production of new heavy ICBMs because the United States believed that these were dangerous first strike weapons and destabilizing. In START II, even though it never entered into force, it eliminated that whole class of missiles. Again, all three of those treaties were driven by defense strategy goals. However, at the end of the Cold War, those defense strategy goals became less prevalent. Um, and I would argue in both the, uh, the Moscow Treaty of 2002, signed by the Bush administration, and the New START Treaty, signed by the o Obama administration, it was fundamentally more about getting the United States and Russia on a path to further reductions in numbers of nuclear weapons. 
I'm not saying that New START or, uh, or um, Moscow Treaty were destabilizing, but it seemed that the focus was numbers versus stability. Um, and I think one of the biggest mistakes we made in both Moscow and New START was allowing the Russians to continue to develop heavy MIRV ICBMs. Had we insisted on maintaining the limitations, I think there's a good chance that we probably could have prevented the production of the, the development of the SARMAT, which is a new, highly destabilizing Russian heavy ICBM that will replace the SS-18. And from a stability perspective, especially in an era of renewed great power competition, uh, as well as these new technologies that Daryl discussed, this is not a good thing from a stability perspective. Uh, third, since the end of the Cold War, there has been a increasing blurring of the lines between arms control and disarmament. Arms control and disarmament are really two different concepts. For example, the Cambridge Dictionary defines disarmament as, quote, the act of taking away or giving up weapons, end quote. However, in his book, Strategy in Arms Control, Thomas Schelling defined arms control as, quote, forms of military cooperation between adversaries in the interest of reducing the likelihood of war, end quote. Now, within the context of U.S. domestic politics, I think the blurring of the line between um, arms control and disarmament has done significant political damage to the arms control enterprise. You know, as Assistant Secretary for Arms Control, I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill talking to Republican members of Congress. Part of this was a result of the fact that my nomination language languished in the Senate for 18 months, 519 days to be exact. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out why I had such a hard time getting through the Senate. I had worked for Democrat and Republican administrations, and I thought I was relatively mainstream. And the more I spoke to members of Congress in the Senate, in the House, basically what the Republican members told me was this. They said, Frank, we had no problem with you. Uh, the problem we have is with arms control. Arms control is a gift that we give to the Russians. Uh, arms control is about leading us to a world without nuclear weapons. And, you know, it really got me thinking about the importance of trying to articulate to arms control skeptics, in many ways, what John said. Arms control can be used to advance U.S. strategic interests as well as kind of manage competition. Um, finally, I believe that the current arms control framework's most serious long-term challenge is that it is increasingly unresponsive to the evolving security environment. In particular, the current framework is not constraining emerging actors like China or new technologies like cyber in outer space. Take the INF Treaty, for example. I was actually working in the Pentagon during the Bush administration when then Russian Defense Minister Sergei Ivanov in 2005 proposed a joint U.S.-Russian withdrawal from the INF Treaty. The Russian argument at the time was this. The security situation in Eurasia has changed fundamentally since 1987. 
1987, you had two nations, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, who had intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Now you have numerous countries, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, North Korea. Therefore, we need to modify this treaty or get out of it to address the security environment. You know, my personal opinion, I think the Russians had a valid concern about the security environment and how the INF Treaty was not responsive to that. Now, I don't like how the Trump administration exited the treaty, specifically um, not consulting with our allies early on in creating a political mess, but I understand the strategic rationale. Um, for example, even if we were to bring the Russians back into compliance with the INF Treaty, and I don't think that's going to happen for a number of reasons, you still have this fundamental challenge that the United States' most you know, significant long-term strategic competitor um, is outside that framework. And quite honestly, unless we find a way to integrate China into a future framework, I'm not convinced arms control is going to be that relevant. So I've outlined the problem. Let me give you some of my thoughts on what steps we might be able to take to get arms control back on track. And as Daryl said, I think this is a really good time for people to start thinking creatively. Uh, indeed, Brookings is going to kick off a project next month looking at the future of arms control. So there are a couple of things that I would recommend. First, at the geopolitical level, we need to acknowledge that the arms control relationship with Russia has changed fundamentally since the end of the Cold War. It is no longer focused on cooperative threat reduction, but about managing competition in a way to reduce the risk of nuclear use. Second, defense strategy and stability considerations need to regain their central role when developing future U.S. arms control policy. Reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons should not be the primary objective of future arms control policy. As former Secretary of Defense Les Aspen said in 1985, quote, if we can reduce the number of warheads or reduce defense budgets, that is frosting on the cake. But the real meat and potatoes of arms control is to reduce the chance of nuclear war from breaking out. Third, we need to stop confusing arms control with disarmament. They are two fundamentally different concepts. Indeed, in the domestic political arena, this, has, this confusion has contributed to the erosion of bipartisan support for effective arms control. And finally, if arms control is going to have a future, we need to find a way to incorporate new actors like China and emerging technologies like cyber and outer space into the framework. Indeed, last June, I was asked to testify before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on Russian and Chinese nuclear policy and doctrine. You can find a copy of that testimony on the Brookings website. But the interesting thing about that testimony, yes, I spent quite a bit of time talking about Russian and Chinese nuclear doctrine. But I spent 
just as much time talking about emerging technologies, space, cyber, artificial intelligence, in the impact that will have on strategic nuclear calculations. And as we go forward, I do think arms control can play a role, but we're going to need to think about it differently and bring new ideas to the table, not simply say the current framework is sufficient. Thanks very much. As we've done in other panels, let's, um, let's open the floor to questions. Do, do we have microphones in the back? Yes, we do. So if you have a question, raise your hand, most importantly, so one of the gentlemen in the back see you. Yes, we have a question. Oh, we have a question in the center. So hypothetically, if you guys were writing a thesis on why states <laughs> abrogate arms control treaties, and it's due in a few months, uh, <laughs> Obviously, you highlighted some factors about multipolarity, uh, but can you discuss any other things that you think are relevant? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and I'll come back to the answer I, uh, the issue I discussed about the INF Treaty. Um, I think the reason the INF Treaty is dying is because it's not responsive to the current security environment. From the Russian point of view, it's not allowing them to deploy the types of capabilities they need, in their opinion, to deter threats in Eurasia. And from the US point of view, uh, and I know Bridge Colby uh, is here, and he talked about this quite a bit, is that it's not constraining China. So going forward, as we think about new arms control mechanisms, I think it will be critical that we design agreements that are, are flexible and can respond quickly to changing circumstances. John, do you want to add? Can I just ask, was the question why states leave arms control agreements? That's correct. Excellent. Um, in addition to Frank's point, which I think is well taken, uh, in the case of the INF Treaty, I would also point you towards the more gradual breakdown of the verification mechanism. One of the major breakthroughs of the INF Treaty in the late 1980s, and actually one of the products of American pressure on the Soviet Union for arms control, was that the INF Treaty included an on-site inspection system that actually allowed American allied inspectors to travel to the Soviet Union, verify in person that these weapons were being destroyed and also uh, at various times visits to production facilities to ensure that those facilities were shut down, I think also to testing facilities at various times to make sure what was going on there. Um, I, I can't actually recall the date off the top of my head. 2002. 2002, uh, that verification mechanism ends. And so I think that there's a more powerful incentive once that verification mechanism ends for the Russians to look at this and say, well, there's a possibility here for us to perhaps pursue a policy under the radar. Um, and to draw out the American response because it would be more difficult for the United States to prove that this is happening. So I'd recommend looking at the way that verification mechanisms uh, function as well. I, I, would just, I would just add on to this. So you, 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 um, um, in that hypothetical that a student might be writing such a thesis. <laughs> for, a, for a friend, I For assume. a friend, yeah. you're asking for a friend. <laughs> so you heard about verification. You should, you know, there are a, a range of hypotheses you should entertain about. There could be change of objectives of one of the states who previously signed or change of the domestic politics. But I just want to kind of make sure everybody heard the conversation between Frank and John the way I did, which is if you're asking why countries leave arms control agreements, though it might not be your only answer, one of the questions you might want to ask yourself is, well, why do countries join arms control mm -hmm. agreements in the first place, with the intuition that being if the conditions that led them to join them change, that maybe that'll lead them to leave. And just to make sure you guys all heard the Frank and John conversation the way I did, they really did offer two very learned, very thoughtful, but quite contradictory views. Not that they're saying the other one is wrong, but, but John, Frank's story about why countries join and pursue arms control I'm not trying to caricature, but it's very much about the goal of stability, the goal of competing in a stable way, 
Well, John's story is arms control is a means of advantage. It's a means of competition. And those two stories, which are undoubtedly both true to different degrees, and they could dispute how, what, how much each, those would lead you to different hypotheses as to the conditions under which that would no longer be the case, and hence you'd withdraw. Yeah, and Daryl, let me just say, I don't disagree right? with John. I think, for example, with doing away with heavy merv ICBMs, I think there were some issues associated with gaining U.S. advantage, but also enhancing stability. And I think his points on INF are very well taken. Uh, the United States is fundamentally a sea and air power. We are not really a land power. So I think by eliminating land-based intermediate range and cruise missiles, we play to our advantage to the Soviet disadvantage. And I think it's important to remember that the INF Treaty was very controversial in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. Indeed, the military did not want to sign. But because of the geopolitical situation at the time, i.e. Gorbachev needed to reduce tensions with the West uh, in order to invest the, those military funds into the Soviet economy, he forced the Soviet military uh, to sign on. But there was a lot of grumbling at the time. And as soon as the Russians kind of regained their footing, thanks to oil money, they started pushing to get out of the treaty or to uh, adjust it appropriately. Can I just add as well to Frank's point uh, about large ballistic missiles? Um, I also agree that there is a sort of dual logic to this, right? There is a stability-seeking logic that large ballistic missiles are just inherently bad. There is also an advantage-seeking logic that Russian large ballistic missiles are bad. And I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the arms control programs that the United States pursues most consistently throughout the second half of the Cold War is the limitation of large ballistic missiles. I think the fact that there's a sort of happy coincidence of how those overlap helps us explain why that policy is pursued as vigorously as it is. It's very difficult then to say, even with the documents we have, who was using whom in the American domestic political context. Was it the cooperators who were sort of duping the competitors, the competitors, the cooperators, or was it just some, again, sort of happy coincidence and compromise? But I think that the two are intimately related. Um, Next question from the audience. We're going to try to give preference to students. If you're a student, raise your hand even higher. I see a couple of hands over here. Uh, so it seems important that we include China in any future arms control agreements. But uh, given the fact that China has made a lot of progress technologically and it's growing its conventional force while kind of disregarding its nuclear force, what goals would China have that um, by agreeing to an arms control um, agreement or like what circumstances would it occur under? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a hard question. Quite honestly, if I were China in looking at my defense strategy, which is fundamentally about pushing the United States out of the Western Pacific, uh, I would not give up my ballistic missiles. So the question from the US point of view is what would we be prepared to trade with China to bring them into such a framework? And right now, I don't think there's much. For example, I don't see the current administration or a future administration agreeing to limitations on US missile defense. For example, China has a much smaller nuclear arsenal than the United States. So they're much more concerned about our missile defenses. So I think the view is if you know, this was part of a package, you could probably entice China into that discussion at least. But I don't think that's going to happen. So what I have been trying to think is that through is that in the near term, I think it's very unlikely China is going to come into that framework in any type of legally binding way. So the question is, are there some pragmatic confidence building measures we in the United States could put on the table to start that process? Uh, one idea that I have, and uh, 
I've talked, discussed publicly is the idea of some type of pre, missile pre-launch notification regime with China on a bilateral basis, like the bilateral agreement we have with Russia, which was originally signed in 1988. Um, another area, and uh, this is a proposal that uh, our, my colleague Brad Roberts has talked about, and that's the idea of inviting the Chinese to a US-Russia arms control inspection to you know, let them understand what they're doing. Uh, on outer space, um, towards the end of the Obama administration, I led several rounds of the US-China space security talks, which I established, looking for ways that we could work together to prevent the creation of long-lived uh, debris in outer space. So my bottom line is this. I don't see any movement in the near term, the next, say, five years, that Russia's, uh, excuse me, China's going to come in to a legally binding arms control framework. I think it's unlikely for a variety of political and strategic reasons. What I think we should focus our attention on is developing some pragmatic confidence building measures to begin a discussion with Russia, uh, excuse me, with China, with the long term objective of bringing China into that discussion. I might just add really quick uh, on less specifically on the policy and more on the historical perspective. Um, I think I agree with Frank on basically all the policy. From the historical perspective, I would not underestimate how important coercion was to previous American successes in arms control. This isn't to say that I advocate coercing adversaries today, but there is a, I think, powerful pattern in the relationship of the United States to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The United States decided to deploy a ballistic missile defense system, or at least discussed one, called Safeguard in 1970, 1971 and the Soviets came to the, tr the table to negotiate an ABM treaty. When the United States decided to deploy Glickham and Pershing II, its own ground-based intermediate range weapons, the Soviets came to the table for the INF treaty. And when the United States decided to deploy MX, a larger, if not large, ballistic missile, the Soviets came to the table for start one. And we don't have a very good sense historically of what was going on inside of the Soviet government, but we know from the American perspective that the Soviet deployment of capabilities like the SS-18 large ballistic missile plays an important role in bringing the United States to the negotiating table as well. So when it comes to the longer term relationship of the United States to China and what would actually incentivize a country like China, which historically has very little interest uh, in arms control negotiation, I think that's a fair characterization, arms control with the United States. Um, at least from the historical record, I would not underestimate the power of mutual coercion. Uh, in driving that relationship. We have a student in the, toward the front. There's a microphone coming to you. Yep. And then we'll open it up to the non-students out here. Oh, well. So right now we'll open it up to the non-students. <laughs> okay. Oh, Ye Wanji from Radio Free Asia. And I have a question on North Korea. Uh, we have several contending issues with North Korea when it comes to the ongoing nuclear negotiations like sequencing and sanctions relief. So would you able to share your thoughts um, regarding the ongoing negotiations with North Korea? How can you move the talks with North, North Korea forward? Well, I'm not really a North Korea non-pro expert, but, but let me make a couple of points. One, I think it's important to talk to North Korea about their nuclear weapons program and their other, let's just say, unhelpful behavior. But I think we need to be realistic. I don't think that the North Koreans are ever going to give up their nuclear weapons. From my perspective, uh, the fundamental question is, how do we manage the situation? Um, and I think 
to manage this situation effectively, we're going to require a comprehensive strategy that includes diplomacy and engagement, includes sanctions, and includes missile defenses and conventional and nuclear capabilities. Um, again, I support efforts to talk to the North Koreans. You can't just yell and ignore your potential adversaries. You need to engage, but we also need to be realistic. Again, I don't focus most of my time on North Korea. I'm primarily focused um, on great power competition, but that would be, be my strategy. I also, again, I think I would echo, again, all of Frank's uh, suggestions. Um, the one thing I would add is that uh, I think that even, with, even if we accept a nuclear-armed North Korea, even if the United States accepts a nuclear-armed North Korea, the possibilities for arms control are not exhausted, right? There are opportunities for the United States to engage North Korea, as it has been actually in the last couple of years, on questions of missile testing and deployment, the specific sorts of delivery capabilities that North Korea uh, might have for those weapons. So again, I think that there's opportunities for progress, even though I agree with Frank that I think it's unlikely that the North Korean government would surrender the weapons. Yeah, I'll just add one thought to this. Which, and, and the reason I'm adding it, so I'm also not an expert in North Korea, but I've thought a lot about, about uh, military capabilities on the Korean Peninsula. I'll add the one thought just because it's like one of the most, um, it's, it's one of the things that you're not allowed to say, but I don't work for the United States government, so I can say it. Um, and that's echoing what John just said about there are still possibilities for agreements that are good for the United States and maybe even acceptable for North Korea in this dimension, even if in fact it is true, even if it is true that there's no real hope for, for real elimination on the, on the peninsula. And, and that possibility is if North Korea fundamentally needs nuclear weapons because that's its trump card to prevent intervention in North Korea by South Korea or the United States or China, if that's why it fundamentally needs North Korea, um, nuclear weapons, perhaps we can tacitly live with that. If fundamentally what we'd like to have is a freeze on long-range missile tests in North Korea, we'd love to achieve more than that. But if we were able to achieve a freeze on long-range missile tests um, from North Korea, perhaps that leaves a situation that we can live with. Now, the reason that's verboten to say in an American political context is what I'm basically saying is it's leaving a North Korea in a situation where it can reach out and strike US allies in the region with nuclear weapons, yeah. which the allies don't like. But what I would be willing to say if I were representing the United States government to our allies is, yes, uh, my Japanese um, uh, ally and friend, we would love to reduce the nuclear threats of Japan. Show us a route forward, and we'll be interested. But if we're not able to do so, it's a valid concern to reduce the nuclear threat to the homeland of the United States, both because partial success is better than none, and also, arguably, it frees us up to fulfill our defense commitments to you and the South Koreans. But so I do think that there are politically unpopular, they might have to be tacit and not, not written down, but politically unpopular um, uh, uh, agreements that could serve both parties, where North Korea tacitly becomes a nuclear weapon state into the indefinite future, and where the United States gets to freeze the long-range test that would put the US homeland in greater risk than it is today. Questions from other people? I saw there was a hand up over here from a long time, and then we'll come to the gentleman. Oh, one, one last round of questions. Okay. We are out of time. So yeah, yours was the very first hand I saw, and I'm sorry, we'll, we'll be happy to chat afterwards. I, I just want to say, having sat here all day, that China remains a giant mystery. A lot of the theories that have been articulated today and discussed, China just, I'm an empirical research scientist, and I just always ask the question, does the theory fit the data? And it just doesn't, because China could have 2,000 nuclear weapons. There's literally nothing stopping that from happening. They have the complete capability to have as equal sized nuclear force as any other great power. They chose not to. They chose to build certain classes of nuclear weapons. They chose to situate them in certain locations and they chose a defense posture and none of it fits the theories that are articulated today in any really sound way in my mind from listening. Um, I only thing I can come away with, and this directly affects arms control negotiations of any sort, is that I think their number one posture is to make it so no one would ever dare to think about landing troops on the Chinese mainland. Beyond that, I've got nothing. And I, and I, because I just don't understand why, given the scope of what the world is right now and their own, and their own views about the world, why they wouldn't have 2,000 deployed nuclear weapons as opposed to, best estimate, 300. That's the big mystery for us to think about. 
So I'll, I'll take, take a quick crack. So it's a great question, and, and, and your broader point that you're raising is basically that we shouldn't assume that all countries are reasoning about this in the same way. And putting aside questions about we shouldn't assume rationality, I do think that the governments of all the major states in the world are fundamentally rational and reasonable and goal-oriented. But there's lots of different strategies that one can adopt with respect to national security strategy or, or weapons acquisition, et cetera. I personally don't think that China is as much of an anomaly, as, 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 or it's not as puzzling to me. I'm not saying I could have predicted it, but I think you can tell a story that makes it make sense, which is, which is China did not become a nuclear weapon state in the midst of a really fundamental existential political military rivalry in the same way that the, that the Soviet Union did, where in the wake of World War II, they thought they might face World War III, and they were facing an adversary who had nuclear weapons and just used them. China became a nuclear weapon state in a, different, in a different environment, which they did have national security threats. They had rivalries with the Soviet Union. But it wasn't as dire. And they therefore spent money on other things. And they spent money on economic and political development and economic development at home and slowly building up their conventional forces. And now they're taking seriously, I think, their nuclear forces. The, the one thing, the one reason I'd say I'm satisfied to some extent with this explanation, which might seem ad hoc or post hoc um, in your mind, is because for years and years, when Kira and I would talk about nuclear weapon strategies of countries around the world, we were always told China's fundamentally different. China sitting there with a small number of land, small number of land-based ICBMs doesn't seem to care about the vulnerability of its nuclear arsenal. And then lo and behold, as soon as China gets richer and it starts to get into a more intense political conflict with the United States, it spends the substantial resources necessary not to create, not just to create solid-fueled mobile ICBMs, but to create long-range ones. And so I do see them adopting a different version of the same strategy. To some extent, it's a puzzle, but I don't think they're completely off on a different track doing a different nuclear thing. They're putting their em emphasis and their resources in a different bas set of baskets than we and the Russians did, but I think you can understand that. Can I just add as well? I think the scope of the Chinese arsenal also looks different depending on where you sit. Obviously, for us here in the United States, it's sort of easy to look at their relatively small ICBM force and say, this is a tiny arsenal. Why even have this? I think that the Chinese nuclear arsenal looks very different if you're in, say, India. So again, in terms of where Chinese nuclear strategy is oriented, I am not an expert on China in any sense. I'd punt to Fiona on that. But um, I think in general, it, it, the size of the arsenal and its, and its purpose might look differently depending on where you are in the world. And I would just add, I'm not as concerned about their nuclear forces as I am of their asymmetric attack capabilities, especially offensive cyber and anti-satellite weapons. So I really do believe in the long term, China remains probably our number one strategic competitor. And if arms control is going to play a role, we're going to need to try to find a way to bring them in the framework. They cannot stand outside the framework. Amen. Great. Please join me in thanking our panel. Uh, if, I could, if I could say, I thought that was excellent. It was such a, it's really nice to end on such a strong, uh, strong set of comments. Um, great Q&A. Terrific leadership as a, as a, a moderator, of course. Um, I think overall we've set a pretty high bar for the second annual uh, um, Theory and Practice of Security Conference. If you'd like, you can go ahead and mark your calendars. Basically this time uh, next year, March, I think 17, 18, 19, I forget. Um, uh, uh, topic to be determined. But again, we will search for something that uh, forces us to grapple with what we, you know, what theories we have in our toolbox and how, how good they are at helping us understand the real world. Um, uh, thank you all very much for attending, and we'll see you next year.